Across the small L liberal tradition and across the conservative tradition, there is a claim that's made, at the very least, a question. The claim is that government's first duty is to keep us safe. It is at least a question. Is government's first duty to keep us safe? As a kid, when I would hear about liberal mumbo jumbo and social welfare mumbo jumbo, about trying to help people live better lives or, you know, care about trees and forests, that it was failing to acknowledge the first duty of government, which was to keep people safe. Now, I think it's an arguable preposition, an arguable proposition. But very often when that argument is made, all that's talked about next is, I don't know, the military or police. On the line with us now is Dr. Sanjeev Sriram, calling to us from California, who's going to talk to us about what's been happening with Medicaid. And if the government's duty is to keep us safe and to keep us alive, and if the first priority of any legislation is to not result in the loss of human life, connecting the dots between what's happening with Medicaid and what's been happening with human life now is something the good doctor can help us with. Happy Veterans Day, sir. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Doctor, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. The, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, what are we learning now about the, uh, what are we learning now about what's happening with Medicaid deaths and the loss of life? Yeah, so um, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities just published a report last week. And what it shows is that Medicaid expansion, that is the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, has saved at least 19,000 lives nationwide. And in states that did not expand the program under the ACA, there are 15,000 people who have died prematurely as a result of that political choice. And that is, uh, it's, it's actually you know, mind-boggling to, to see this data because the people who did the study did the really hard work of trying to figure out, okay, if a life is saved in the 2014 to 2017 timeframe in a state that expanded Medicaid, how do you know whether that life that was saved was because of Medicaid expansion or because this person chose to put on their seatbelt or, you know, um, got a ride when they were too intoxicated to drive? How do you know that this life was saved from that? And they did a painstaking amount of detailed research to come to this number, and it is 19,000 lives at least were saved in states that, ex that chose to expand Medicaid between 2014 and 2017. So say the numbers again, and then I, I want to go back to methodology. And thanks for being with us, yeah, by the way. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, glad to be here. Glad to be here. So the, the numbers again, if your state expanded Medicaid, you, you live in a state that, along with other states that made that same policy choice to expand Medicaid, 19,000 lives at least have been saved. If you live in a state that has chosen not to expand Medicaid, there are 15,000 premature deaths that have happened because of that policy choice. So give us some examples about the ways that lives have been saved or the ways that lives have been lost that uh, help us give some texture to those numbers. Yeah, so um, according to this report, one of the most important things that happens when people are in under coverage with, uh, with Medicaid is that they are rescued from false choices. And what do I mean by that? I mean that when people you know, manage to go to the doctor, like someone like me, and I give them a prescription, and then they have to turn around and go to the pharmacy, and now they have to decide, okay, I only have so much money in my pocketbook. I've got to figure out groceries. I've got to figure out stuff for the kids. I've got to figure out my own prescriptions. When you live in a state that expanded Medicaid, the cost of your, of your prescriptions just went down enough where you don't have to choose against getting your prescription so that you can, you know, so you can feed your family. You can afford to do both, which is kind of what you're supposed to be doing in the richest country in the world. Um, but that's actually a huge example of how you can save lives because people are able to you know, take care of themselves 
and do preventive medicine and take care of their conditions before they get really bad. And that's exactly what guys like me wanted to go into healthcare for was to help people get better and to, you know, not have to deal with this nonsense of, am I going to eat or am I going to, you know, get the prescription that the doctor said. So in states that adopted Medicaid expansion, they saved 19,000 lives. In states that declined Medicaid expansion, they lost 15,000 lives. Did I get those facts right? And then say more about the methodology. How do we know that, uh, that those numbers are accurate? Yeah, so you got the numbers correct. And the way that we know that these numbers are right is that the researchers actually did a lot. They spent a lot of time with looking at data from the American Community Survey. It's the largest federal survey which has income, on, which has information on income, age, and other determinants of Medicaid eligibility. And then they line those up against administrative death records. And you're able to take these huge sample sets and compare, okay, so we know that this many people in this state, you know, finally became eligible for Medicaid. We, you know, and we also see that there is this big drop off in the death rate in those states for those age groups because people who were, you know, you know, previously maybe, you know, I mean, at risk of dying because they couldn't afford to go to the doctor are now under Medicaid and they're getting to see the doctor finally. And so, it's a lot. I mean, it takes a lot of time and detail to go through this data, but these researchers have, have done it. And in fact, they're speculating that the 19,000 lives saved might be an underestimate for the number of people saved simply because the longer, like one of the things that they found was that the longer Medicaid expansion has been going on in your state, the more and more lives have been saved. When we compare this with the loss of life from, I don't know, any number of uh, highly publicized threats, heck, the uh, president and previous president's focus on on terrorist attacks, uh, hard yeah. to find. I mean, it, what are what are larger drivers of premature loss of life? Maybe auto crashes. Uh, I know gun violence is uh, is uh, may, maybe still tobacco. Where does this? If you're going to try to rank stuff, and maybe it's apple, apples right. and oranges, but if you're going to try to rank this, put this in some context with other right. threats. Uh, how would you help give it some context? Well, I'm glad you brought up the automobile issue because what they, the researchers themselves found, this is not just me saying this as somebody who's a fan of Medicaid and believes in the program and wants to see it expanded everywhere, but what the, what the researchers found is that if every state had expanded Medicaid to the best of their ability, the number of lives saved among adults in 2017 would roughly equal the number of lives that seatbelts save across the entire American population. When we look at the states that have turned it down, I'm actually looking at a map right now uh, that I mm -hmm. think is accurate, that's showing that, I mean, it's basically the South, right? I mean, some in the Midwest as well. But where are the states that uh, Mike Bevan just had uh, just had a highly publicized loss as Kentucky governor uh, and right. linked to his own uh, declining, uh, his own attempts to decline, but eventual uh, eventual adoption of Medicaid expansion, I think. Uh, but it looks like a lot of the southern states uh, and a lot of the red states turned it down. How would you characterize the states that uh, have done it versus the states that haven't uh, expanded their Medicaid programs? Well, I mean, this is now my personal opinion. It's not reflecting the, the researchers. But to me, ever since the ACA went into effect in 2013, which is the first year that Medicaid expansion became available to states and that it was an option for them to either expand the program or not, it really does feel that the more spiteful your, your state was against a black president, namely Barack Obama, hmm. then the bigger, the worst chances were that your state was going to expand the program. And it's really tragic to see these numbers because when you look at a state like Florida, there are over 2,000 lives that could have been saved from 2014 to 2017 had the state chosen to expand uh, Medicaid. You know, similarly in North Carolina, there's 1,400 lives that are at risk um, and, it, I mean, they have 
in North Carolina, they have a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. And so there's this gridlock that is stopping Medicaid from being expanded. And it's it's tragic that this this level of pettiness and this type of what I feel is um, racism in politics, that a, that a black president's policy is not being acted upon, is tragic because the lives that are at stake and the conditions that I take care of don't really care what your politics are. Diabetes and asthma and seizure and cancer, they don't care what, who you vote for. They don't care where you get your news from. And this is life or death. And we should be better than this as people. We might have our political differences, but when it comes to public health, we need to be better than this and expand Medicaid in every single state. Well, I'll t tell you, doctor, the map uh, tells the story that your words are telling. That to me, it, it's not quite a map of the Confederacy, but it resembles it significantly, right? It's Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, moving over a little bit, Oklahoma and Texas. Then it starts getting a little north. You still, yeah, Missouri, Kansas, South Dakota, Wyoming, Wisconsin. But as soon as you get to the American West, as soon as you get to the Northeast, as soon as you get to Washington, Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Montana, Maine, New York, Pennsylvania, et cetera, all of them adopted Medicaid expansion. All of them saved 19,000 lives, and you say that might be an underestimate. And if you look down the states of the Confederacy, they all uh, crushed, with the exception of Kentucky and Virginia, who did their best to crush it, or at least Kentucky. Virginia, which just had a, just won a trifecta of Democrats winning. But you move into the right. deep south, and it seems to bear your story pretty well. And, you know, what I would say about Kentucky and Virginia is that they have an opportunity to use this newfound knowledge and, I mean, and look at what was, has been working and what's not been working with their Medicaid expansion. In Kentucky, the first Governor Bashir did the right thing of expanding the program as soon as he got the opportunity. And in Kentucky, the number of lives saved cannot be exaggerated. I mean, they did a fantastic job of saving people, and especially in the midst of an opioid crisis that hits Appalachia particularly hard. Medicaid worked wonders in Kentucky before, um, I mean, during uh, the first Bashir's term. Now that a new Bashir is in, I would say, I would ask that governor to look at this data, and I would actually ask the um, Virginia legislature to do the same, is to look at this data and to ask, like, where are we putting up hurdles in front of people when it comes to Medicaid eligibility and enrollment? where we don't need hurdles and where we could actually be saving more lives. In Virginia, they've got work requirements where I would say, you know, yeah, repeal the work requirements, but then also look at, I mean, whether you've got unnecessary time limits, whether you've got kids and families who are slipping in and out of coverage on, with Medicaid, and get rid of that, streamline it, make it easier for people to hold on to this coverage because we have proof that this is saving lives. I have on the line Dr. Sanjeev Sriram, who is sharing the research that demonstrates what happened with states that did adopt Medicaid expansion and those states that did not adopt Medicaid expansion. And a difference of 19,000 lives saved for those states that did and 15,000 lives lost for those states that did not. And doctor, thanks for sticking with us for just another minute or two. What do you say to those folks who say, ah, but we shouldn't give it to Mexicans? We should, what about, we can't extend Medicaid until the border is secured. Until we've built a wall, we don't expand Medicaid. We'll be saving the wrong lives, not American lives, not people who become uh, Americans by a, a legal process based on current laws. What's your respo response to that? Why should, we, why should we prioritize Medicaid expansion when there's other things to worry about? So... Whenever I, I mean, because I've heard this question before, and, you know, I always like to look behind the question and figure out who's asking it and, like, what, how do they benefit when we are divided? When patients and families who are struggling, right? Because all of us are struggling with this current healthcare system. And so many of us are, you know, struggling to pay for the prescriptions, to pay for the co pays, and, the premiums and everything else, you know, if you move between one state and another, are you at risk of losing Medicaid coverage? All of us are struggling with this right now. And by taking our struggle and turning it, turning it towards animosity for immigrants, 
we are doing the dirty work of an oligarchy, of an arist- aristocracy that is happy to see a struggle and is even happier not to pitch in to help, uh, to help in any kind of way. And I think the only person who, bent, who is you know, really happy to see us fight against immigrants when it comes to our health care are those billionaires who are not going to be held accountable for what they owe the system. And I would say that we are the richest country on earth. We can afford to take care of every single human being in this country, regardless of immigration status, documentation status, uh, um, where they were born, whatever. We can afford to do it. We are the richest country in the world, in the history of the world. And I, I just reject the, the false choice that we can't do this for everyone. And doctor, what is happening? Is there any impact of this data? Are any of the states that have rejected Medicaid expansion, do we have any indication, any of a rethinking, or that the voters within those states are demanding change? So, you know, I mean, when you um, when you look at that map, right, that you were um, alluding to before, to me, some of the brightest signs of hope are when you look at Nebraska, Utah, and Idaho. Um, these are, you know, classically red states and they're, um, you know, they, they fit a conservative mold in a lot of the conventional uh, political reporting. But when given the chance to ask voters, do you want to expand Medicaid in your state under the Affordable Care Act, each of those three states, the voters, the everyday people said, absolutely, yes, we must expand Medicaid by huge majorities in Nebraska, Utah, and Idaho. They were willing, like everyday people are looking past their own politics and are doing what's right for public health. What's tragic is that you've got these state legislatures and governors who are either trying to block the will of the people, stall it, or do the barest minimum possible so they can legally say that, yeah, we kind of did what the voters wanted, but we didn't do the full spirit of what the voters wanted. And so I look at us as, you know, everyday people, and I have a lot more optimism that we know what we need to do to take care of each other. And it's that we have got political machines that we have got to take back and reown and bring them to our will. Well, Doctor, really appreciate your time. If there's a, if there were a site or a reference that you wanted to plug that you wanted people to take a look at, what would you want them to, where you wanted people to find out more, where would that be? Well, the, um, the Center for uh, Budget and Policy Priorities has their, um, and, sorry, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities has this report that we've been referring to on their website. It's cbpp.org. Um, I myself am working on Medicare for All and, and making racial justice a cornerstone of Medicare for All. And that work can be found at socialsecurityworks.org slash all means all.